We are at the Eagle Institute at Rutgers. I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News. We're here for the Rutgers program on the governor. This afternoon, we're going to talk to Bob Huey. Bob was the DEP commissioner during Tom Kane's first term as governor. Bob, how did you get involved with Tom Kane? Um, not until after he actually got elected. I don't think I'd even met Tom before that. And um, I had been recommended by some people from South Jersey, probably Bill Gormley, most principally, um, for a position. Uh, Tom had a, a search team uh, led by a really sharp guy, a professional guy named Bill, I think it was Bill Henderson. I, I hope that's his name because he's a great guy. And, um, and I, I ended up getting interviewed. Um, and he was, we had a great time, you know, he, he was, uh, he asked great questions about DEP and the state and, and he was, he, I think he was a good friend of Tom, so he had a, a sense for what Tom was looking for. And then they set me up with Tom uh, for my first interview. And the first interview happened to be at Tom's house. And I, I remember um, the interviewer saying to me as, as we set it up and I left, he said, uh, one, th one thing I might, might ask, he said, do you, do you think you might wear a tie? And I said, I don't think so. I mean, I don't want to sell a, a false bill of goods here. I, I'm not going to wear a tie later. So I went to Tom's house, actually, for the first interview. And it was, a, it was about a two-hour interview. I remember it. I, it was late in the afternoon. And it started getting dark. And, uh, and Debbie, his wife, came in at one point and turned on the lights. So, but we, we had a very engrossing talk. I, but I think Tom, at that point, and, and subsequently we talked about it, um, the day before he had been briefed by um, an environmental uh, gentleman, a gentleman from North Jersey who was a, a fine guy. But I think the perception at the time was, you know, somebody from South Jersey ought not be running DEP. You know, Why? But, uh, I just think there was a stronger sense that environmentalists came from North Jersey and not from South Jersey. Uh, we don't have a lot of cabinet officers from South Jersey. I had been uh, county administrator at one point in Atlanta County. What year? Um, Actually, it was right after the change of government, so I think it was probably like 75 to 77 uh, for uh, Chuck Worthington, who was a Democrat and an assemblyman at one point. And that was right after the change of government. I had, uh, my, I had a little consulting firm. On, uh, I was teaching at Stockton, and I had a consulting firm. And we had what at Stockton? Politics and public policy and planning, sort of a combination of, of things. Where did you grow up? Where'd I grow up? Yeah. Pittsburgh. What part did you do? I grew up in Pittsburgh, went to Gettysburg College, graduated, joined the Army Reserves, got sent, by, and, and my first job was after the Army Reserves, after my basic training period was in California for DuPont, which was great. I, I loved it, lived at the beach, <clears throat> came back to uh, the Maxwell School at Syracuse to get a master's degree in public administration and actually worked at Syracuse so, and, and enjoyed the, the university environment. And after that, after I got my degree, I, I spent a year um, doing commercial real estate and decided this isn't really what I want to do. So I took out a map of the United States, uh, of the East Coast, circled all colleges within 15 miles of the ocean. and, and uh, Stockton was in its second year at that time and went to Stockton College as a cooperative education director and then evolved into teaching and planning, um, at which was a, a little better time management. And we had done this study for Atlantic County when they changed their charter. Chuck Worthington got elected this, this, you know, despite huge odds. It was very Republican County. And, um, and the, the, the modus at that point was the Republicans weren't going to make it easy for Chuck. And so I got a call, you know, about a month into his term uh, or into his transition, and I walked in to meet with him, and he was sitting at this long table. He was county executive. He was county executive. And he was in his transition. It was like him all by himself. And I walked in, and there was this long table, and these files were set up, you know, maybe four feet high at, all the way down the table. And he said, uh, do you think maybe you could come in and be county administrator? I don't know. You know, this is, this is overwhelming. Chuck Worthington was a great guy, um, a, 
a gruff, tough guy, but, but not at all like that in, in person. And uh, I took a leave of absence from Stockton to do that. Anyway, getting back to the original question, you know, I was a South Jersey guy. I'd been a county administrator. Uh, I was known for having some opinions. I had a planning firm. We represented a lot of people. Um, and I think, you know, the, the perception was you, you don't have somebody from that community in this position. Tom and I, on the other hand, got along really great. We just, we, he was prepped one way and I was prepped another way. Um, but he, we both realized it. And, and it, I think it was my first exposure to what Tom Kane was really like. About a week later, I got a call and said, Tom would like to interview you uh, again. And he admitted that he had been, you know, he said, listen, I, was, I, had, I had something in my mind. Somebody had just, you know, briefed me. Let's talk again. And we, and we did. And we had a great time. Was uh, he governor or was it transition? He was in his transition. transition. He was in his transition. And uh, he said, I, I, I think you can do this. I said, I, I think I can do this too. So that's what happened. That's, and, and, you know, then I met with the transition team, which was at the time for DEP, was chaired by Tony Chikatawa, a very good friend of Tom's. Um, we went over the issues. Um, and I spent a lot of time before I went there just getting ready for what the issues were. I had a very good feel for the planning side. I didn't have a, a good feel for all the other things that were, were going on. What were the top two issues? Top two issues at the time were probably um, the, the environment was changing, the environmental world was changing, and DEP was facing all these new issues that they hadn't had before. Um, cleanups, environmental cleanups. Superfund was, was just coming into being. And, what, and you know, what was the strategy going to be? Um, ultimately, our strategy uh, on that issue was, which, which you know, was, was really Tom's decision, but we, I, we presented a case to him that said, listen, nobody knows how to react to this, this federal legislation. And people are going to take a long time getting started for Superfund. And in many cases, it's embarrassing to get started for Superfund because the first step is you got to admit you have the sites. And, and we, we should register as many sites as we can as quickly as possible. And that's what we did. I mean, we just loaded up the list uh, and qualified for more money than any state in the country uh, in terms of Superfund cleanups. But it was a courageous thing on, on Tom's part because, A, you acknowledge where you are. Uh, and B, you, you know, you're putting it all out there. We, we've got 100 sites. We want to we line them all up for Superfund. It turned out to be a great strategy, um, even though Superfund didn't turn out to be the program anybody wanted it to. So that was, that was one issue. And the other issue is we were running out of money for things like sewer construction, water. Um, it, was, you know, it was not a great period. Um, and we, we've talked about that before, but the early, early 80s, 82 was, you know, not unlike other periods that we've been in since then, but uh, the economy was off, unemployment was high, and there weren't a lot of funds to do a lot of things. There, weren't, there wasn't a lot of money for infrastructure. Um, so, you know, the, the first couple years, it, it was trying to match up needs with resources. Uh, let me go back just a couple of years. You, you say that Chuck Worthington was a Democrat. Were you a Democrat? No, I, I never. Were you a Republican? I was an independent, okay. um, and 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 have been an independent with with uh, I think one exception. I was running somebody's campaign, and they thought it would be embarrassing if you know an independent was running their campaign. So I switched for about two years. I've been an independent uh, since the mid '70s, and and am today. And all the time I worked for Tom, I was an independent. Uh, you and Kane had never met before the interview? Uh, I don't believe we ever had. We, we may have run into each other at, at a, uh, when he was getting a briefing session on something in South Jersey, but I don't, I don't think either of us ever remembered it. I think we met for the first time in the interview. Do you think he was concerned about you? Uh, he took a leap of faith, obviously, but do you think he was concerned about it? I don't think he really was. I think Tom had, um, if you look at the cabinet, Mike, I, you know that was, it was probably one of the most diverse cabinets um, that I've, by, you know, that I've ever seen, in it, before or since. And and it was just it, it, there's a massive group of talented people, uh, a lot of whom Tom didn't know. I mean, Ken Biederman was the treasurer. I don't think he and Tom had ever met before then. Um, 
Art Brown was your agricultural secretary. Now Art was, you know, a historical component of government, but uh, and 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 he was a unique opportunity for Tom because they could later both do New Jersey New Perfect together commercials with a New England accent. If you remember Art Brown, um, Hazel Gluck, Gordon Putnam, Rick Goldstein, Lenny Coleman, you know. There, and then the front office, which was Kerry and then, and then uh, Greg Stevens, I mean, after a short period of time, Greg. And it, it was just this diverse but very, very talented group. Uh, and anybody I left out of that list of cabinet officers, just because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But, and, I, and Tom's priorities were, did you share what he wanted to do? Did you share his opinion on what could be done? Um, did you share his concern? And the environment was really one of Tom's first concerns. And could you manage it? Could, could you manage the department? Could you manage uh, 3,000 people going in different directions? Was it difficult for you to do that? Um, no, I think, I, you know, I was benefited greatly by the fact that I had been a county administrator. You know, I knew, I knew something about budgeting. I, I knew a lot about public management. I had learned a lot of lessons about how, how you treat people and how you recruit people. And I, so, it, you know, I think that, w that was very helpful to me. George Albanese, who ran human services at the time, under Tom, had also been, he had been a um, county manager. So he brought, you know, pretty good management skills to another very big department. And, and I think Tom did that very well. I mean, he, he wanted to know, he, he didn't just want a planner. <laughs> it was nice that I was a planner. He thought that was important. But he wanted somebody that could manage a department that was very, very important to him. You know, Tom's later, when, when we had some resources and we could start doing things in government, Tom's three things were education, the environment, and the economy. And the three E's, that's, that, was his, that was his mission. So that was an important position to him. Uh, Helen Fenske, a longtime friend of the governor, was uh, appointed assistant commissioner. Right. Uh, was her role a difficult one for you? No. I, I, I loved Helen Fensky. I, I think, um, you know, I took, in, in the department, I took very much the same approach that Tom did to the cabinet. Um, I recruited a very diverse group of people. Helen uh, was recommended for that position because she had a long-standing relationship with Tom. Um, but I embraced it. I thought she brought a whole she brought a range of, of interest and activities and, uh, and experiences that were invaluable. And she was a lot of fun to work with. Helen had a great personality, an outsized personality, and um, had already made her reputation before she came to DEP. Hermia Lechner, who was, who was a mayor from Hunterton County, was somebody that I, I brought in to run Green Acres. Now, Hermia was, I didn't know how old Hermia Lechner was. I just knew she was cool. She was a dynamo. She could make people listen. She had a great environmental record. And um, I used to get calls from Greg Stevens every once in a while saying, you know, do you know any Republicans when, you know, when I was sending resumes over? But the call on Hermia was, do you know she needs a waiver? She's 70 years old. I had, I had no clue. She had more energy than anybody in the department and did for four years. So what I tried to do was just to pick this group of people that had a lot of talent, and they didn't necessarily have to have the same kind of experience that I had or the same, come from the same area that I did. Uh, John Gaston, who we, run, we brought in to run water supply, uh, our attorneys, uh, Mike Catania, who I brought in from Legislative Services. My feeling has always been as an administrator that if you can bring in 10 really good people, you can run anything, you know, because those people will pay enough attention to make it work. And that's what happened. We brought in probably more than 10. Uh, but, and it was, uh, uh, again, a very divergent group. I, they were so divergent, we didn't call ourselves, I had two names for, for our group when we were, we were there. One was the B team, we never aspired to be the A team. And the other was the green machine, you know, we were. What does that mean about the B team and not aspiring to be the A team? What, what's the well, A team? I, it, it was a joke. I, I thought, you know, uh, we, we had this group of people, they were all young, except for our, you know, our balancing, I mean, we, we had, we had, I've always believed you should have a little mix in any, in any group. You should have some old people because they bring incredible wisdom. And I've always said, you know, when I'm teaching, wisdom is just a, 
a collection of mistakes. And, and that's true. You know, we all learn from the things we did wrong. And then you have to have young people that, have that, that, that are excited and want to go forward and want to have fun. So I, I just comically one day said, okay, you guys are the B team. You're not the A team. You're the B team. And, and, it, and it worked. It stuck. I mean, each, I, I went to a, um, a retirement party for uh, somebody who just retired from the Attorney General's office who started out at DEP uh, all those many years ago a guy named Jerry Burke, who ended up as third highest person in the Attorney General's office. Great guy, great guy, very committed to New Jersey. He, you know, he was a member of the B team. And, um, and I was uh, one of the people at the, at, the, uh, at the ceremony brought a hat that he had stuck on a wall for 25 years that, that said the green machine that, that I used to give to people for doing something special. You know, and what they did special was they took on a major polluter, crushed them, and, uh, and never looked back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we just had this, there was a camaraderie and a, and a really good feeling that you could accomplish a lot, that you could change the attitude of a lot of people about what DEP was and how it did its business, uh, that it wasn't all you can't do, it was we can do. And, and it was a fun, a very, very good time. Uh, in 1983, I believe, dioxin was uh, found in Newark. Was that a big development? It was, it was a scary development for two reasons, Mike. I, I, and you were there with us during that period. That was, um, it, it, nobody knew what it was. You know, and, I mean, nobody, How was it found? By uh, you know, I don't even remember the exact history, but we found it at an old industrial site in, in uh, Newark. In the Ironbound, uh, very special district. I mean, great people and uh, with big investments. I mean, it was a, a, a real community, and um, we, find, we we knew it, we knew it was polluted. So they're testing for it. They find di dioxin, and uh, it, it was something that nobody. We we called. You know, our immediate call was to the Center for Disease Control. We had a great research guy in our department named Tom Burke who uh, is now a, a dean at Johns Hopkins, I mean, a brilliant guy. And he said, I don't, I don't even know why, you know, at what level this is dangerous. So we called the Center for Disease Control, and they didn't know what level it was dangerous. Uh, you know, it was just like, oh, okay. Well, so we, we fenced off the site, taped off the site, and, uh, and went up to Newark. And as you recall, I, I know you were there, Tom Kane came up and, and we briefed him, and he held a, uh, a press conference in a bar in, North, <laughs> in Newark. Um, and, and we were just completely candid with people. We said, we have a problem. We know what it is. Uh, we don't know at what level it's dangerous. We will publish every result we get from this site, even if we can't quantify it, because you deserve to know. But we don't know how to deal with it yet. And, and that's the way we handled it. And Tom did a press conference. I think people felt a lot better about where we were going and how we were going there. Um, and he bought a round of beer, and uh, and and we, you know, it was like 11:30 at night. A classic Tom Kane. Uh, he bought a round of beer and didn't have any money, and and so, and so the, uh, the the state cop who was in charge, Mike Fedorik at that time, Mike Mike later became a casino control commissioner, is now at the Port Authority. Uh, Mike's a, a really good guy, and he and I paid. I, and, a, and the reason that that stuck in my mind was I didn't have enough money to get off the parkway that night. I, I mean, I was tapped. Uh, but that, I mean, that was, I think it was representative of, of how we decided we were going to handle our, our problems. We didn't always have the answer, but we weren't going to hide the fact that we didn't have the answer. We were going to admit it, and we were going to disclose it to you and other members of the press. And it was, as you recall, that was, you know, it was a pretty tough time. Uh, but disclosing it and then telling people, geez, we don't know what we're going to do, but we have, we've got everybody in the country now looking at this, and we'll come up with a solution. I, I think that's the best you can do under those circumstances. And, and at that press conference, it was also representative of how the Kane administration did business. I mean, it wasn't just Tom, and it wasn't just me. It was Rick Goldstein, who was Commissioner of Health. It was Tom Burke from my department. 
it was, it, you know, it was like everybody we could bring to the fray, we brought to the fray. I do. I was there. <clears> I do remember the, he, hearing the governors coming up for this major announcement. There was a kind of World War III quality about that story. I don't know if it was because nobody really knew how dangerous dioxin was, or because we hadn't had this kind of a toxic scare before. Well, it was. I think it was a lot of things. We didn't have it in a residential area. Um, we later did. I mean, in other places, West Orange, and you know, where, where we find other pollution problems. But, radon. Yeah, radon, and um, and uh, but it, it was it, it taught us a lot about how you deal with issues like that, and 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 Way how to, to teach you openness. Absolute openness. You know, absolute openness, and and candor, and get the site secured. And, and, and try to help. You don't always have, I mean, when we ran into the radon problem in West Orange, again, nobody, it's now become a very common problem. We, we, we're th but we're talking about the early 80s where it wasn't a real common problem. And all we knew is we had to move the soil somewhere. Uh, and, and radon soil exposed was not a hazard. It was a hazard because it was sitting under houses. And, and that was another Tom Kane. I mean, special. I mean, we, we looked around for sites for temporary storage, decided on an armory, um, and um, had a meeting there. But the, the funny thing was that it was the, the armory was, was adjacent to Tom Kane's property. I mean, it wasn't like we were picking areas that, that, that weren't affecting somebody. Uh, I didn't know that when we picked the, the armory. I didn't know Tom was that close. He knew. I, you know, I think it was one of the things that probably surprised him most that I would choose to do. We ultimately didn't do that because th there was an outcry and, and it was hard to do it. The trouble with environmental problems is solving them means frequently taking them somewhere and nobody, nobody wants to. That's, that, that's where they lose interest, you know. So. Um, we did an interview with Chris Daggett who was involved in the environment, uh, and he brought the issue of the PJP landfill in Jersey City. Was that something you worked on? Yeah, that was in 1985. Uh, it was an underground air, uh, a fire. It was um, a hard one to deal with. It was a, you know, I think everybody was, was worried for a period of time about, um, and it's not unlike the oil spill uh, that we've, we're, we're going through in Louisiana. When do you step in? Do you remove responsibility? Do you compromise responsibility? And um, and and we, uh, meaning all of us, uh, just decide. Well, we're not going to worry about that. We'll bring in the best people in the country to put it out, and we'll, we'll we'll pick up the pieces later. And that's what we did. Brought in a guy with a reputation for handling handling all kinds of hazardous thing, red somebody, and uh, got it done. Uh, Boots and Boots or something? Yeah, yeah, that was the name of the firm. Name of the firm? Yeah, yeah. I think something like that, yeah. Um, you said that the biggest environmental issues were uh, adjusting to the Superfund and, and confronting how to deal with toxic sites and uh, the infrastructure issues. Um, did you work on creating an environmental infrastructure trust? Yeah, that was... Um, we, we started out with a concept of the environmental trust led to a whole lot of things. But we, 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 we were looking for ways to spread money um, longer. And how, how could we take a revenue source and create a pot of money that could be used more than once, which led to the, you know, to the, the concept of a combination of low interest or no interest loans. And which are essentially at some level over some period of time like free money and grants. Uh, but while they're free money, they keep coming back so you can keep doing new projects. And we, we looked at that first for sewer construction. Um, we looked at it for Green Acres. We want to look for a way to make Green Acres funds go longer. Um, and we realized that the sewer thing was, was difficult because we had to change federal legislation to allow us to use federal dollars as a part of the trust fund. And that, that sort of took two years just to, to walk through. 
because the New Jersey congressional delegation. Yeah, actually, at that time it was Bill Bradley, who was the who was the prime helper. Um, but I mean, it was it was heady stuff because we were trying to change the nature of federal legislation, and a lot of communities, uh, principally big communities, big MUAs, didn't want to lose their place in line. You know. It, if, if you say to them, we're going to capture these dollars and put it out in a different form, they say, no, we waited long enough. We, we're now we're number one. We want our money. Um, it, well, it's not like we're going to benefit the many instead of the few. The few, uh, and the few happen to have a lot of power in the legislature at that time. So we had some very raucous, you know, two o'clock in the morning legislative sessions with, with people who were friends of mine. I mean, the guy who was, who was running the hearing was Dan Dalton. Uh, was a friend, is a friend, uh, but Dan wasn't going to lose money for Camden, and so <laughs> they were on the list. And so it took us a while to work it out. But ultimately, Michael, to accommodate that kind of trust legislation, the federal government changed their regulations, and Bill did that. Bill Bradley did that. Um, we went down and, and did a number of, of briefings. Uh, I remember meeting Howard Baker, who was you know chief of staff at the time. Pete Domenici from the, the Senate Committee. There were a lot of people who got interested in how do you make money go further. So the first infrastructure trust legislation in the country came out of New Jersey. Uh, and, and accommodating it was done by the federal government. But whose, the idea, whose idea was it? It started, it actually started at DEP as a, as a way to, to make environmental programs run. Sewers, Green Acres. Um, and it, and it was, I guess it was my idea. I mean, I, I was riding up 206 one day, and, and I, I remember got to a diner, um, pulled into the parking lot and started trying to draw a map of how you might be able to use funds in a different way. Having said that, that was the easy part. You know, it's like any good plan. The plan's easy, and then you gotta figure out how to do it, and I took it back to a bunch of people in the department who were good with numbers, a guy named Lee Pereira, Brenda Davis, who yes, subsequently became policy director under Tom. And the, you know everybody looked at it the first time and said, gee, I don't know. And then we brought in some investment bankers and it started to look good. Uh, we took the idea to Tom and frankly, the first need in the state at that point was transportation, not, not our programs. And so uh, the, the idea emerged as a transportation trust. That's where the, the need was. Um, the infrastructure hadn't been invested in for a long time. And, and John Sheridan took the program, you know, took this concept and, and he's, John's always really great about, you know, it was your idea, fine. You know, it was my idea, but it would have never come to fruition without Tom's support and, and John's hard work because then we called in all the legislators and said, here's what you get and here's what you don't get. You know, here's, here's how it works if we do this. And so, as we know, the Transportation Trust Fund was, again, one of the first in the country. And it was a great idea. It's, it, it's not a great idea anymore because it hadn't been funded properly, but it was a very good idea when it started. The Environmental Infrastructure Trust became, I, I remember the term from the 80s, the Infrastructure Bank. Right. And that became the Transportation no, Trust No, the Transportation Fund? Trust came first, and then we had an Environmental Trust. Uh, Infrastructure Trust, which was sewer and water, um, uh, or sewer. Was that and, during your term, or did that come in? Uh, in, term? in my term, and and the Green Acres Trust, which which started to revolve funds, so they all evolved from that one concept. Uh, they just came in sequence. And there still is a New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Trust today. Right. Yeah, there is. I, I, I'm not real familiar with it anymore, but there's a Green Acres Trust that we know, and it, it's it's continued up until today. Um. You say you were driving up 206. Where were you living at the time? I live in I, I live in Margate, uh, and, and did then do now. So it was a, you know an hour and 45 minutes of uh, time to think on the way up and on the way back. Did you drive yourself, or did you have a drive? Drove myself. I, I um, that that was one of my claims to fame when I was a commissioner. But it really wasn't a sacrifice. It was um, I get a headache <laughs> riding in the back seat of a car. In those days, everybody had a driver. I think uh, my predecessor in the department had two drivers. Um, Why two? Uh, one for the north and one for the south. 
And, <laughs> you know, I mean, truthfully. And I used a driver one day uh, to go to Monmouth County for a meeting with beach mayors. And I got a headache on the way down, and on the way back I said, uh, you don't mind if I drive, do you? And, uh, and I drove back, and that was the end of the driver. Got him a job with, with another commissioner. Uh, Margate sits next to Atlantic City. Uh, how was Atlantic City in those days? Then, uh, those, those were heady days for Atlantic City. You know, that was the gaming had just passed, um, you know, in the, in the late 70s. Uh, the town was turning around. There was a tremendous amount of investment and a lot of activity. It was, uh, it was good days. Bad days right now because, you know, those things, that, that circle has, has sort of come halfway around again. Uh, was Tom Kane committed to Atlantic City? Yep. I, I think Tom was, uh, I don't know that Tom was ever the greatest fan of gaming, um, but he saw Atlantic City as an economic, economic development uh, engine. I mean, Tom had a very good way of looking at things and, and seeing what the positive were. And, and he saw that as, as an industry. And frankly, it was an industry. It was probably producing more tax revenue than any of the top 10 industries in the state. Um, and and that, was, that, was, that was part of Tom's theory. You know, it works. It's good for the state. We'll make it work better. The, uh, there, there was a, a proposal for a coastal commission during your tenure uh, modeled on the Meadowlands and Pinelands commissions. Uh, it didn't come to fruition. Do you recall that? It wasn't, it wasn't during my tenure. That was, that was just following mine. Um, and they, and, and it, it could have, uh, come to fruition. I mean, there was already um, a CAFRA, Coastal Area Review Act. That's, right. not, that's not what you mean. That, that, no. that was around before that. Um, and then there was another set of regulations proposed under, uh, I think, the Coastal Commission. Um, it didn't work for, for two reasons. Um, uh, but the principal reason was it it wasn't necessary. There was already a Coastal Re Area Review Act, um, which could have been refined or, in, or you know, improved. It could have been tied into resource money. Um, and so when people on the coast saw it, they just went, wait a minute, we already have this. Um, and, and it was hard to explain why you had to take another step. Actually, it was an impossible explanation. And, um, I, w I would have never tried to do it that way. I mean, I wouldn't have tried to do it that way, um, just like I wouldn't have tried to do the state plan the way they did it in Christy Whitman's era. I, I didn't think it was well explained. I don't think it was tied to, to benefits or resources. And so I, I think sometimes people jump too quickly without knowing, you got to know the climate. Um, the reason that I wouldn't have done it is I, you know, I know the coast. I've been on the coast. I, I know every mayor down there. And, and, uh, and there's a way to explain things, and there's a way to work with them, and then there's a way to tell them that you're gonna, they're going to do what you tell them to do. And we, that, that, that kind of top-down planning very rarely works. It just doesn't. How often did you see the governor when you were DDP commission? I saw him a lot. You know, it was, it was uh, again, it was one of his, his favored departments. Um, we had cabinet meetings regularly. I mean, it wasn't like every once in a while. We had regular meetings. And, but in between those meetings, Tom, Tom is uh, the kind of guy, and, and it's hard to believe now, because I'm not sure it's ever worked like this before or since. Um, but if I had something going on, and, and, uh, and I thought he should know about it, I walked across from the EP building to um, the state house, walked across the lawn, went in, told Barbara, Barbara Grove I'd like to meet with the governor for a few minutes. She was his personal secretary. Yeah, great lady, and um, and and go in, and and we chat for a while. I mean, not not long. We, we you know, but we we chat for ten or fifteen minutes, and I'd walk back across the street. It was it was great. I mean, there were 
the access was was incredible. How about the uh, amount of rope that he gave his cabinet officers? There, there's a sense that he gave people more rope than subsequent governors. I, I think he 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 had a lot of confidence in his in his cabinet members, um, and in return, his cabinet members had a very deep sense of appreciation uh, for him picking us, for his approach. Now, Tom Kane is, uh, I, I've seen him since, and you've seen him a lot, and everybody in New Jersey has seen him a lot. Um, Tom's a nice guy. I mean, he is just an inherently nice guy. And he always gives credit to people. I mean, when you ask Tom Kane, how, how did, what did you do as governor? And he says, well, I, you know, I picked good people and they were better than me. And, you know, and, it, and the fact of the matter is that uh, he means that. It, it just doesn't happen to be true. Tom Kane is, he was smarter than all of us. He was tougher than all of us. Uh, but he was also more compassionate than all of us. And in exchange, we had this tremendous appreciation. And he did. He gave us a lot of rope. And we all had... Uh, one job, which was, you know, plan ahead, cue me in if something's going on, and the mistakes are yours. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, go do it. Well, he was <laughs> tougher than any of us. Was he tough? How was he tough? So, Tom Kane is a, uh, you know, he, he's like the nicest person I've ever met but he, and one of the brightest people I've ever met, but he's also tough. Tom gets... Tom always gets where he's going to go. I mean, you watch his time in the, in the legislature. You watch his time as governor. When Tom Kane wanted to achieve something, he was very focused. And he, and he was going to get it done. And, but the difference between Tom and, and a lot of people that I've known since in that job, um, or, or have seen since, is that Tom never declared victory. He, he always shared victories. And so he had this great way of making everybody around him feel like they were part of the solution. And it, we've talked about it. Uh, historically, there was not a major piece of legislation passed in Tom Kane's time as governor, not a, not a single one that I know of, that wasn't a bipartisan piece of legislation. All the trust legislation that we were talking about, environmental legislation, Green Acres legislation, uh, all those things had a Republican and a Democratic sponsor. So Tom Kane's, uh, when, when, th when they talk about Tom's politics of inclusion, it was not just inclusion of people and groups. It was, it was an inclusion of politics. He, you know, he, he had a very good understanding of politics and, it, and the strength to make it work. Uh, and he let the cabinet officers, I, I've always said, there are two kinds of politics. There's big P politics, which is partisan politics. And there's little P politics, which is public policy. And the difference is, you know, he, he let us deal with the policy uh, and the departments. The politics, he always took care of. He, he understood how to do it. Now, he had a lot of help. Kerry Edwards was a, was a former legislator and had a unique way with the legislature. Uh, Greg Stevens had an incredibly good sense of politics uh, and, and could run a lot of balls at one time. He just had a, a, good, a good flow to him. Uh, and Tom, I think, would tell you in, in both those instances they were invaluable. But, but Tom always called, you know, he knew where he wanted to go. He had an amazing relationship with the, with, uh, with the legislature. And honestly, the legislature was different then. I mean, there were guys like Moose Ferran, Larry Weiss, and, and I mean, you could sit down with those people and, and did. I mean, the first time I ever had a, um, a budget hearing, first annual budget meeting for me, I met with uh, um, Moose Ferran and, and Larry Weiss at Moose Ferran's cabin up in Hunterton County. Now, uh, a lot of people in New Jersey to watch this won't remember these people, but, but I remember them. Uh, you know, as perfectly as it, it, it was yesterday. They were great people, and everybody should remember. I remember them, uh, and Ferran was the chairman of the Budget Committee in the Senate, and Weiss was the Democratic right. Budget Officer. Right, So I meet with them at a cabin in Hunterton County on a little lake, and uh, we had been instructed, the Kane administration had been instructed to, 
to lower our budgets by 15% or 10% or whatever it was. Ken Biederman was running, you know, very tight ship. We had a guy running around at that time doing a management budget and budget analysis, uh, separate office. And so we got these instructions, cut your budget by 15%, okay. So then I go see Moose and Larry and, and uh, I said, well, what are you gonna do on a budget? I said, well, I'm cutting it by 10 per 10 or 15%. Or no, well, what areas are you cutting? And I, and I told them what areas I thought I was going to cut. And they said, well, listen, uh, why don't you, you know, add this area and subtract that area and, and, um, and then we'll put it back. And, and I'm thinking, well, you know, this is not a bad deal. So we, we sat there for a couple hours and talked and they said, there's one condition, one, one condition we're going to put on this. Every commissioner who comes in from DEP brings this, always brings this entourage. They bring, a, you know, somebody to testify about every part of the budget. We want you to do it by yourself. Can you do that? Yeah, I think so. I think I could probably do that. I mean, now, now I have, I'm studying like for a month and a half so that I can do it. Uh, but I did it. And we put in the, you know, the budget. And they started putting forward these resolutions. <laughs> well, and by this time, it's not just Moose and Larry. It's like... Everybody on the budget committee's got some resolution to put back money that I'm taking out. And I'm starting to add it up in my head. I think I got more money than I went in there with. Uh, I know I, I had more money, that, but I think I had more money than I would have even asked for. And uh, Ken Biederman was beside himself. It, it, it happened, I don't know that it happened to a lot of people, but I know it happened that first year to George Albanese and I, because he also went to Moose. Um, and, and nobody, and, and Biederman's trying to figure out how we did this. You know, how did this happen? I'm going, hey, I, I play by the rules. I cut my budget. I went in there. I, I, it was not my fault. They put it all back. And uh, I, nobody said anything for like two months. And Tom, about two months later, said, how did you like the cabin? So Tom Kane had been to the cabin. He made those deals. And, 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 uh, and I think that, that's what made Tom unique. I mean, he, he liked all those people. And they really liked him. And they trusted him. I mean, if Tom Kane said, this is what we're going to do, and here's my hand, uh, they knew it was real. And, and we dealt with a different kind of legislature. I mean, they were, and, and they would look ahead. You know, they were cool people. Besides Moose Ferran and Larry Weiss, who did you deal with in the legislature? I, I dealt with everybody. I mean, everybody was into the environment in those days, as, as you recall. Uh, and every committee had some piece of it. You know, whether it was on the green side of the department, green acres and parks, uh, or on the pollution side of the department, or on the water supply department side of the department. And in those days, we were also putting together the first water supply master plan for the state of New Jersey. And so we ran into every committee. And, and they were all pretty good to work with. I mean, I, I, I thought that, that, that the one thing they all had in common is, is that if you didn't embarrass them, they didn't embarrass you. I mean, that, that was sort of the unwritten rule in those days, you know. And, and occasionally people would step up and, and, and try to take you apart. Um, and, but, but mostly they learned that that wasn't the way, you know, that we were going to share the good news anyway. We weren't going to take credit for every program. That, that we were going to work with Democrats and Republicans. And when the word gets out that, you know, that's the tenor, I, I remember in the, the last session we did with, uh, in a bigger group for the Tom Kane archives, um, John Lynch was there. And I, I think by John's own admission, he said, you know, people accused me of being a policy guy in the 80s and a politician in the 90s. And it, it's very true. In the, in the 80s, I worked with, with John Lynch on about five major programs. He was a policy guy. And he cared about the policy, he, you know, he cared about an urban policy, he cared about water supply, he cared about the environment, and everybody was like that. Lynch was the Democratic Senate president. Uh, Tom Kane's chief uh, rival or antagonist in the legislature during your time in the Kane administration was probably Alan Karcher, the Democratic Assembly Speaker. Did you have any contact with him? Yeah, I had a lot. I, I mean, I, I thought Alan was one of the, uh, the great characters. I mean, he changed, um, he did dramatic 
you know, 180 changes in personality and in approach every, 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 every so often, you know. And, um, but he was, he was super bright. Alan was a really bright guy. And, he, and when he wanted to give you trouble, he could find 10 different ways to give you trouble. And he didn't stop. I mean, he was just, he would keep going. Uh, the problem was, he, I, I think, which worked to Tom's advantage and, and to all of ours, is Tom, as Alan was so strident that even if he, if you conceded a point, he wouldn't stop, you know. And, and so he didn't get a crowd. He didn't, he wasn't taking votes away from your programs. He was, you know, he was, he was just criticizing your programs. And there, there's a difference. But I, I thought Alan was one of the brightest people around. Who did you work most closely with in the administration? in the governor's office or in the cabinet? Um, it, as I said, we, we, had, we had this interesting thing about cross-department problem solving. I mean, we, I work with, with John Sheridan on, on, on Transportation Trust and then on a bunch of environmental issues because um, then like now, I mean, people realize it more now, but transportation and land use are sort of interconnected. Um, I work with Rick Goldstein on a lot of health issues. I work with George Albanese just, just because I like George. I mean, we got together on a lot of things. Um, I work with Barbara Curran and the Board of Public Utilities on garbage because that was a huge issue. Where are we putting garbage? And um, if, if people don't recall, but in those days, you know, we had a lot of, of dumps in New Jersey uh, and we were phasing them out. And we had to make counties make plans for how to, they were going to handle their garbage. And it was a hard, hard sell. Um, we were selling recycling at a time when, you know, it wasn't an easy sell. It, it, I, environmental problem programs are very easy sell emotionally. People want to do it. You know, they want to, and, and today and then. They're just not sure they want to pay for it. So taking care of garbage the right way is more expensive. What was the right way back then? The right way back then was to, to build secure landfills, which had never been the case before. Uh, the, the right way was to look at the potential of resource recovery. The right way was not to say, rather than do it the right way, we're going to send it to some other state and get rid of our problems. That was not that, the right way. Uh, that wasn't the right way. They used to uh, send it out on freight trains? They still, I mean, listen, there are probably, there's probably still garbage going out of state uh, all these many years later. but. I, my, my philosophy on this and the reason we work so hard and the reason we push counties so hard, I mean, at one point I sued 21 counties. Not an easy thing for a former county administrator, but not, it, it wasn't the hardest thing I ever did either. But it, the, the right way is not to transfer your problems to a state that doesn't happen to be um, as sophisticated as you are, as aware of environmental issues as you are. And, and so I didn't have a problem with that fight. I didn't have a problem saying people ought to pay more for recycling. You know, it, if you want to do it the right way, be willing to pay for it. I do remember the, uh, the mandate to counties to uh, come up with waste management plans. Right. You were pushing, I believe, big time in those days, resource recovery plants, big incinerators. No, that was one. Uh, we, we never figured that there, there'd be any more than three. We, we figured they would, people would find a way to merge uh, their, their solutions. Um, and those, those resource recovery facilities could generate electricity. They were, they were closing the circle on an environmental issue. Um, but to do that, you had to control the waste flows. And one of the reasons, um, and, and this was a point that Tom got because Tom had this, this great regional view. One of the reasons we needed to control our waste flows is because at that point in time, New York was sending garbage to us. <laughs> Pennsylvania was sending garbage to us. So you can't say to people uh, in other states, you can't come in here when you don't have any control over your own waste. There, you can't have two standards. And so if we were going to enforce legislation and waste flow controls that kept New Jersey or kept Pennsylvania garbage out of here until we could get our, our, our act together, keep New York uh, garbage out of here so we could get our act together. 
then we had to get our own act together. And so forcing counties to do it was just one piece of the pie. It was also protecting the state of New Jersey. And that was a, that's a hard issue. A lot of people didn't get it. We don't hear about waste issues these days. Did we solve that problem? I, I, I doubt if we've solved that problem, but I think we're doing them, you know, and, and we're probably still shipping garbage uh, with some frequency. But I think what's happened is that everybody's become a little more attuned. And so even the states that, that don't mind taking garbage, that see it as a, a benefit, um, they've learned how to deal with it in, in a more environmentally sensitive way. And we've taken a lot of things out of the waste stream. <clears throat> so it's not quite as dangerous. Were you DEP commissioner when New Jersey mandated recycling of cans yeah, and yeah. newspapers? <laughs> yes? Yeah. And how did that, uh, uh, how did you deal with that? That was great. I mean, everybody supported it. Um, uh, but, but nobody wanted to pay for it. You know, it, would, it is, you know, it, it, it's a funny thing about people. And, it, and, it, and it's not just recycling. I mean, it, it's like people want more and more out of government, and um, they would rather not pay for it if they could. You know, so it, it's, but good, good things in government don't come for free. Good services in government don't come for free. So you got you to decide, is it worth the price? Recycling was worth the price, even though at that time and subsequent to that many, many times, there's been no, no market for the product. I mean, but, but doing it right, and, and at other times, you know, there was, there was a boom a couple years ago where every piece of paper we could produce was going to China. You know, they were using it. So. Are we leaving any issues out during your four years? Uh, we've talked about toxic waste cleanup and environmental infrastructure trust and waste management and recycling. Uh, radon, was that big in your That wasn't, I, I, radon was not big at that point. I mean, because it, it was. It came later? In the second it's, it's sort of, it, it emerged later as, as a more um, a generic issue. I mean, radon. People in New Jersey now routinely uh, have a radon inspection of a house before right. they buy it, is that right? Well, a lot of people do in, in various parts of the state. It, it's a part of the natural environment. And when we were dealing with radon, it was a, a pollution problem. It had, been, it had come in as a result of fill, the radon contaminated fill. Uh, it later became uh, a, a problem that everybody realized came from rock formations and granite. And, and so a lot of people, yeah, everybody tests for it now. Um, what else, anything else that, uh, you, um, big issues that you had to deal with? Dioxin we talked about. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it seemed to me at the time that there was an issue every day. Um, you know, there, there was some issue every day. Water supply we've talked about. I mean, New Jersey's first water supply master plan. Um, Did we have water supply problems back then? We anticipated water supply problems. We knew we were going to have droughts, and we needed controls. We needed to be able to move water around the state um, and exercise controls over the companies that had that water, which was, again, you know, uh, when you think about it now, places in the West still haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> New Jersey was doing it in the early 80s. Um, figuring out how to, how to use resources within urban areas so that, um, I think in our, in our last meeting, you know, working out a sewer arrangement where Jersey City could grow because they could use somebody else's excess capacity. Um, and, and making that possible despite you know, some environmental opposition and you, know, you shouldn't be moving sewer you know, water from here to there. Um, but it was a practical solution. It worked to everybody's benefit. Did you deal with uh, sprawl and concerns about sprawl? Sprawl wasn't the biggest thing then. I, and it just wasn't. I mean, it, that became uh, the catchword, you know, probably at, at the end of Tom's administration. Um, it, could be a, it could be a catchword today. I mean, sprawl increased in, in 2010 in, in, in New Jersey or in 2009 by 8%. So it's not a problem we solved. Brownfields, did you deal with them? Just, I mean, we, we probably started identifying brownfields. We didn't come up with programs to, to redo them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think, again, it's, it's a program that, that still hasn't developed. I mean, we, 
we have a port area with all kinds of brownfield sites, and we have to have an ability to, to if, if the port area is going to grow, we have to be able to develop them. We've developed very few of them. Um, you know, we haven't made it easy to do. We haven't taken an overall, you know, coordinated approach to doing it, a Tom Kane approach. We haven't brought the economic development parts with the environmental parts, with the, the infrastructure parts to do it. We, we have all kinds of people dealing with it and nothing's getting done. Was the department much bigger in your day than it is today, do you know? I, I don't think it was much bigger. I, I, would, I would guess it's about the same. Um, Did you have to downsize at all? During we downsized a little bit in the first two years because, you know, we, the budget was tight in the first two years. Uh, and then we probably went back up uh, as we built new programs. I mean, the, 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 the number of programs that, that went in to DEP in the 80s was extraordinary. So staying the same was remarkable in terms of people. The first year of the Kane administration was uh, rocky in, in most people's re telling of the story and then things sort of righted themselves as the national economy improved. Uh, is that how you re remember it? No. Uh, you remember? I, I think the first year of, uh, um, of Tom's administration was um, realistic. You know, the economy was what it was. Uh, but, but Tom uh, realized that. And, there was a lot of planning going on in the first year and in the second year. I mean, we met with everybody. I, I, had a, I had monthly meetings with the environmental community. I had monthly meetings with the business community. Um, every month. We, and so what we tried to do was put in place things that we could do when the economy returned. So it might not have looked like a lot of things were getting done and, and it might have looked like there was a lot of agita but I never got that sense. I mean, I, I, I don't think Tom Kane, uh, in, in, in all the time I've known him, then and now, I've never seen the guy lose his equilibrium. So other people may have perceived it as rocky. Tom was just fine. <laughs> he had a plan, and he, and he took that first two years to plan. And it, it's one of his other characteristics is that Tom Kane did not rush to a press conference. You know, he was willing, you, you could walk into Tom and say, I have a plan, and it's going to take two years. And he would say, okay. Now you say that, and, you know, and I have, uh, you know, to subsequent governors. Uh, you can pull this off if you take 18 months, and they say, no, we're going to have a press conference in 30 days. You know, so we've, we've gotten to a sense of immediacy. Um, Tom never had that sense. Tom was in for the long haul, and it, it's, it's one of his greatest attributes. He's a very patient man, um, and, and, and he conveyed a sense of calmness, uh, not just to me, but to everybody. I mean, he, he took this divergent group of people. He said, we're all on the same team, and we're going to get there. And the very little turnover in the first term of Tom Kane's administration, I mean, most of us stayed for four years because we promised we would. Uh, you made reference to monthly meetings with the environmental community and the business community. Do you recall who the leaders in those communities were back so, then? I, I can't remember the business community as, real, as well as I remember, it. I remember uh, the environmental community. They were people like David Moore, uh, Derry Bennett, from, uh, you know, some of the, the David grant. David Moore was the Conservation right. Foundation. Derry was uh, American Literal Society. Literal Society. Um, incredibly talented people. Again, long haul people. I mean, these, these were people that were doing it for 20 years before I met them and did it for another 20 after I met them. Um, the business community was probably guys like Bob Ferguson from First Fidelity who, who served on the water supply master plan uh, a committee with us. And, uh, but there was a group. I mean, it was a representative group. It was probably 10 to 12 on each side. We didn't meet together. Um, but well, we met and we discussed their issues. And, you know, everybody thinks that these things are, uh, 
dramatic, you know, they're opposites. The, the environment's one thing and the economy's another, and they're not. They're, they're, they're very well connected, and they're not always at odds. You know, one thing can help accomplish another thing. Tom Kane always, always used to say that they're not mutually, ex mutually exclusive, and every governor since then has been saying the same thing. But they, don't they uh, conflict often, economic development and environmental consciousness? They, they do it at the, at the project level, you know, where a project can be an environmentally insensitive project. But they don't at, at, at the state level. At, at the policy level. And the reason that I say that is that no business wants to be in a bad state. <laughs> no, no business would, would get pride out of saying, hey, I, I live in the most polluted state. Um, they like saying, I live in a state that's got parks. I've got, I live in a state that is attractive to, the to my employees. You know, that's one of the key components of every business. And so they're not inconsistent at the high level. The, the question is, how do you bridge that? How do you make that work all the way down the line. And 80% of the time, it's not a problem. At the project level, it can, it can frequently be a problem. You say nobody wants to live in the most polluted state, and earlier you said that it was kind of risky to accept the fact that we had all these toxic waste sites. In that period of time when you were at DEP, we did, I wouldn't say pride ourselves, but we did acknowledge that we had more toxic waste than any other yeah. state in the country. Uh, was that a uh, was that a black eye for, for us? No, was I, it embarrassing for us? Or no, I, I think it was a, it was it was one of our smartest dumb moves. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure that you consciously think about that, but when you think of the amount of the money that we got, I, I mean, other states. We're just going crazy. When, you know, after that first year when we had, we were just at submitting them, uh, and we're just grabbing things. Uh, I, I mean, everybody. Then all of a sudden they said, well, you know, they were turning around their DEP saying, why, why didn't you tell us about this? You know, why didn't you tell us we had sites? We didn't have any more sites than anybody else. We acknowledged more sites, and and eventually that got to be known. And, you think about it now in terms of major governmental programs, federal programs, um, infrastructure programs, um, the kinds of programs that go we're going through at the national level where they're trying to boost, in, uh, you know, employment. Uh, when, you, when you're ready, you grab a bigger share of the pie. And, and you know, the trick is to be ready. And, and right now, you know, it's one of those periods again put the plans in place that so when a program comes along, you're more ready than anybody else. You uh, made uh, a point of saying that you were a guy from South Jersey. Uh, did Tom Kane do anything to unify the state north against south? I think, I, I think Tom's, um, gosh, he's, I mean, he's got so many strengths, um, but he unifies everybody. I mean, there is not a place that I can imagine that you could take Tom Kane where he didn't act natural, feel natural, and have everybody compelled to like him within about 15 minutes. I could take him to a mayor's group on the beach and he have him, you know, convinced that, you know, he was their best friend in, in 15 minutes. He could, he could do the same thing in Newark. He could do the same thing in Hunterton County. I, I mean. The on guy, a personal level, but in terms of the north-south rivalry. In, on every level, because Tom's legislation was the same way. If we had a piece of legislation, I mean, our environmental legislation, it was not rare to have Bill Gormley from Atlanta County and John Lynch from New Brunswick. You know, it was, the matches were, the matches did a lot to cover the bridges. Everybody was included in the matches. Everybody was included in the solutions. And, and, and that was... That's Tom's attitude. I mean, it, it just carried over to everybody in government. Everybody went, Tom does it. <laughs> Why would I not do it?